it's a good idea to get some of these new systems in place like the Employment Hero type program where you can have staff sign off on all your policies is quite a good way of doing it. But I understand for small business that sometimes they don't want to adopt these sorts of new softwares because they've got so much other software that they have to use. Welcome back to the Business Behind Your Business podcast where we have the conversations to help your business grow and thrive. And we'd like to bring the experts to you to share their experience, uh, case studies, and help to help you run a great business, but help you deal with some of these situations that arise that you might not be prepared for as a business owner. Hi, I'm Paul Sweeney, your host of the Business Behind Your Business, and this is a podcast for business owners everywhere. So if you're listening for the first time, it's great to have you with us. If you're a regular listener, I'd love you to share this and, and all our other episodes with people who also would benefit from hearing. This one particularly is a very interesting topic that we've had brought to us and it affects all small business owners and it may be in ways that you might not think that it does affect you but we're going to f- explore what these changes are and how they affect your business so joining me today we've invited back one of our regulars Paul Cripps from PK People Solutions. Paul's a licensed and experienced HR consultant helping deliver solutions for your business to help you retain your best people improve your employee performance and make hybrid work, work for your business. So welcome back, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Good to be back here again. And as you say, we've got an interesting topic to talk with yourself and Kylie on today. So uh, thank you for having me back. Great. Thank you. And and our, our other guest today, Kylie. Kylie Maxwell from Frank Law. Now, Kylie's got a lot of experience, over 25 years of working in advising medium and small size businesses wanting to grow their businesses. Kylie advises in employment, work health and safety, compliance and dispute management. Um Sounds That's exciting. Right. <laughs> it sure is. It uh, me on my toes. <laughs> absolutely. I'm sure it does. I'm sure uh, that this, what we're going to be talking about today, the topic we've got is going to be keeping both of you on your toes for the, the coming months. So what is that topic about and why does it make a difference? So we're looking at the environment in Australia. We've got small business and small business are naught to 19 employees and the stat is that 42% of the employed workforce in Australia is employed by a small business. So quite a lot of people. So over 5 million people are employed by a small business. And that stat is courtesy of the Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman's Office. So small business is a big employer of people in Australia. And often small business owners don't have all the resources available and may not be aware of some of the changes that are affecting them. And, and I believe that these changes, there's a number of changes to industrial relations laws have come through in late 2022, in December 2022, and there's quite a lot of changes that have been introduced that have effect on small business employers, and you may not be aware of them. So Paul and Kylie are going to help us unpack what some of those changes are, how they affect you, and what you need to be doing to make sure that you comply with the new rules. So, Paul, thanks for bringing this topic to us. Certainly, it was something that slipped through underneath the radar for a lot of small businesses, uh, December 2022. What what has actually happened? Well, there's a lot to unpack there. That's a million-dollar question. We're going to get through that in the next uh, next half an hour or so. But I think that uh, you're absolutely right. I think the timing of this coming through, I think, has probably meant that, yeah, I think it has slipped under the radar. And certainly, some of my experience of you know, reaching out to existing clients, the vast majority weren't aware and weren't informed. One of the things that I've heard said on a number of occasions is probably, you know, some of the, the biggest changes that have come through since the Fair Work Act was introduced in 2009. And Kylie, would you would you agree with that that statement? And, and welcome to the Paul's podcast. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I would agree with that. There has been a large overhaul through these changes yeah i would say that that was pretty accurate yeah and i think that awareness i think is a big thing i think that a lack of awareness i don't need to know about this this should be right kind of uh, attitude i've heard a lot over the last uh, probably uh, six weeks since i really started to to get my head into this space myself just technically, there are two things, aren't there? I think the colloquial name is the respect to work out. That's not the full definition, is it? And then there's the other aspect to bringing in of the paid domestic violence. And they're two separate pieces of legislation, if I'm not wrong there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I think there's probably seven key things that I've come across. And maybe we can talk through each one of those, those sure. seven points and we can sure. take it from there. 
Um, so the first one is the paid domestic violence leave uh, that's come in. Do you want to give a bit of an overview of that first of all? Yeah, sure. So there's 10 days available for people who are experiencing domestic violence and it's available not only to part-time and full-time staff but also casuals. So I think that's the big groundbreaking kind of change that's been made there. Yeah. Yeah, I know when I first read that it include casuals as well. Um, you know, that goes against any other leave type, isn't it? Because there isn't any that's other right. leave that a casual will be eligible for. I did read somewhere there was a, a highly complex calculation, which I wouldn't pretend to understand about how you calculate what a, a casual's entitlement would be there. Uh, we need to be very careful here where we differentiate in terms of for this leave type, because for businesses of 15 or more people, Kylie, that's the number, isn't it? 15 or more? That's right, yeah. The eligibility for this leave came in as of the 1st of February this year. Uh, For businesses of 14 people and below, it comes in from the 1st of August this year. Um, So we just need to be careful in terms of the definitions there. I find some businesses get a little bit caught out by that as well about who to count and who not to count, particularly sometimes when there are businesses of, that are actually got overseas entities and how do you count how to be in Australia and casuals and stuff like that. I know there is a definition of small business code, isn't there, that, that really covers all that. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And what you're really looking for with casuals is casuals that are regular and systematic in their approach to work. So you've got to you count those, basically. Yep. That's good. Yeah. I do come across some people that perhaps just even employ one or two people that just think they have a complete exemption from any of this. And that is not true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This applies to anybody, even if they just even employ one casual. So the domestic violence leave, I'm seeing this as a new provision, completely new, whereas some of the other items have been yeah. modified. But um, can we just see, go through what exactly is covered under this domestic violence leave and in what circumstances might um, somebody be entitled to it. Yeah, Carly, would you want to kick off on that one or do you want me to kick off? Oh, you can kick off on that one. Yeah, well, one of the questions I've been asked by more than one client in terms of, okay, should this unfortunate situation arise, what do I ask for in terms of, uh, or do I have the right to ask for some form of evidence? There is some guidance on that, which I think will evolve over time, but you are entitled to request some evidence, you know, whether that be down to reports from lawyers, police, the like, and at the moment, any other any other document that the employer might seem reasonable kind of wording thrown in there as well, which is about the R word, the reasonable word. It has previously existed as an entitlement to unpaid leave, but this is now coming for a 10 days um, paid leave as well. But yes, it is a new type. The one other idiosyncrasy I should point out on this as well that I found has caught a few people unaware is that there is a condition whereby if somebody is availing themselves of this leave type, it cannot appear on a pay slip. And that's done for reasons of trying to protect the, the individual uh, from thinking that other people might have access to that person's pay slips. Some payroll providers are already on top of that uh, because there is obligation to keep records, um, but those records can't then appear on a pay slip. I found some providers that are, are quickly trying to get something in place there because it's very different to how things have been before. I've certainly got experiences where at the moment where I've got some employers that if it happened today, they haven't got a system other than keeping records manually. It might just be a case of some employers that haven't got a system in place. It might just be a case of keeping manual records more than anything else. Yeah. So there's going to be some changes to systems, particularly around payroll and em- employee records. Given the, I guess, the stealth mode in which some of these laws have come through, would it be fair to say that some of the, the vendors in the payroll and HR space are really catching up and yet to provide solutions? Look, I think that's fair comment, Paul. And I said to one of my clients probably about three or four weeks ago, and they were a little bit perplexed why their payroll provider hadn't caught up. And I said, well, to be fair on them, they haven't had a lot of time to build something. Uh, some providers were already there. Uh, some managed to put things in place and program their systems in such a way that it's there straight away. Others have been playing catch up. And uh, my main concern at the moment uh, is actually just uh, you know reaching out to people I know and asking my client, who is your power provider? And do you know what system they've got in place to be able to handle this? And have they got a system? And the worst one is, are they aware of it? <laughs> So <laughs> I haven't come across a client as yet that's got a parallel that isn't aware of it. But I think that in a lot of cases, it's going to be a situation whereby it might be easier for manual records to be kept until there is a better system in place. Agreed. 
So Kylie, I've got my risk hat on here and the alarm bells are starting to ring in my head about some of the extra risks that an employer particularly is exposed to here, not just in terms of, I guess, protecting the uh, employee's uh, personal circumstances, but how they maintain and protect uh, the privacy around documents and who has access to those. And do we know what kind of, I guess, obligations are on employers and the penalties for non-compliance? In terms of the privacy, you mean? Mm. Well, I think privacy is probably the, the big focus area that comes to mind. Yes. I think it's meant to be that they manage it in the same way that they do under the Privacy Act. So the penalties are just the same penalties that there were under the Privacy Act for that. So there's some obligations, I think, for employers to make sure you are aware of that. And I, look, if we polled a lot of small business employers at the moment, I would say that the large majority would be... I guess, ignorant of their obligations under the Privacy Act. Would that be a fair comment? Yeah, that would be a fair comment. And it's probably because your policy really dictates how you're going to deal with that information. So if you have a policy dealing with employee information and how you're going to manage that information, that sort of dictates where you go with it. So uh, when we draft policies for clients around that area, we deal with things like employee photos and employee records, their contracts, their, their medical certificates and all that sort of thing and what we're going to do with them. Yeah. And it, it's disclosure to employees what you're going to do with their photos and what you're going to do with their documents, basically. I'm just seeing so many new ways in which an employer can unwittingly fall foul of some of their obligations and expose themselves to, well, potentially fines, but also some some litigation in the future. What could they do to make sure that they, I guess, mitigate that risk? Well, I think they can have like a privacy compliance manual. That's That's a good starting point, dealing with who has access to those records and how far it should go. Usually it's HR that has access to those records and management basically. But uh, yeah, I think a privacy compliance manual would probably be a good place to start. And with that privacy, we talked about employee handbooks and acknowledgement of the, I guess, the policy documents for the business. How do we manage, I guess, the employee acceptance or acknowledgement of those new rules? Oh, it's a good idea to get some of these new systems in place, like the Employment Hero type program where you can have staff sign off on all your policies is quite a good way of doing it. But I understand for small business that sometimes they don't want to adopt these sorts of new softwares because they've got so many, so much other software that they have to mm. use. But Employment Hero is a very good one. Um, it allows you to send things off to um, employees and for them all to sign off on the same policies. Yeah. Mm. I'm thinking more and more it's a case of I know most small employers won't have the I guess, the capacity or the resources to have a full-time HR department themselves and may not um, think that they have the time to learn a a system like, say, your Employment Hero or or a rubber online-type HR products. Is this where a a combination of uh, Paul Cripps and Kylie Maxwell comes into play? (laughs) That's right. Quite lightly. (laughs) Yeah, we tend to lead clients through the Employment Hero scenario. Yeah, we do. Okay. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. That there's some clients that will be quite happy to have a system in place, others that are quite reluctant. And it's very hard for me to describe a tipping point there. But certainly from a good practice point of view, having a system in place that records it, you, yeah, it just makes life a lot easier if there is something in place. And unfortunately, it often comes down to you know businesses seeing it as a cost um, in terms of not just a subscription cost, but then I guess you're right in terms of the time to set something up as well. But as Cardi quite rightly says, it, it's certainly advantageous to have something in place like that. Particularly if you're growing. Absolutely, yeah. 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 Would it be fair to say that it's no longer a case of it's an advantageous acquisition or implementation, but it's more of an essential requirement if, as risk prevention and um, if we look at the cost of non-compliance that would certainly be a lot higher for any business because um, I don't believe ignorance of the law is a valid excuse is is that correct that's correct that's been the case for some time right, <laughs> that's right. it's just a number that goes up per contravention isn't it <laughs> that's right 
Yeah. yeah and, and you're right, Paul. I think it is a case that yeah, the cost of actually subscribing to a system and also the cost of implementing it is nothing in comparison to somebody that, that gets caught for, for a contravention. Um, but uh, look, these sort of things are becoming much more of an essential tool to have in place rather than a nice to have. Certain providers are using this as an opportunity to promote their offerings and services there. Mm-hmm. So th- there's a lot to unpack, and we've really only talked about the domestic violence leave and some of the privacy <laughs> issues that have come out of that. Um, so there's quite a lot in here, and I think we probably wouldn't be giving them justice, but I think we need to mention... There's, there's um, some, yeah, there's, there's some I think we will probably a fair... Uh, there are some probably are more straightforward than others. Yeah. If, if Carly is prepared as well, I think we'll have, a, we'll have a good go of covering as much as we can in the remaining time. Okay. Well, let's get stuck into it because I think, like I said, ignorance is no longer an excuse. Let's remove the ignorance and inform our listeners. Can I go for number two, pay secrecy? I think that this is one probably that, from what I've read so far, Kylie mentions contravention fines. I think the number was $66,600 per contravention. I don't know if that's accurate or not. But this is around what's known as pay secrecy clauses. And if I'm to just, I'm going to put it in layman's terms, and I'm going to get Kylie to help me. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so my layman's terms uh, is this, is that previously uh, employers over many years may have had terms in their employment contracts, perhaps sometimes in policies such as confidentiality policies, maybe code of conduct that talk to people not sharing the terms and conditions of employment with other employees. Um, right. I've come across some where there's been some very clear uh, clauses in um, employment contracts not to do that. Um, now, as of, and I'm going to throw a day out here, as of the 6th of December last year, um, yes. I think, is that right? Okay, good. I okay, said so yes, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, is that, that actually, those clauses no longer have validity. Uh, and as of the 6th of June this year, 2023, um, if, employers issue contracts with those clauses in, there are potential fines. So please make sure you check this to make sure you haven't got um, any such clauses in there. I mean, probably what I'd like to chat through with Kylie is there's some, some ambiguity as well, which uh, <laughs> which, we, which I don't know that we've got an answer for, but we can talk about it. Um, some are very clear. Uh, yes. and, um, and, and others, I think, probably where I've seen, I've seen clauses that, that say, any other information which the employer may deem confidential. My view of so far, Kylie, is I've I've tried to get employers to exercise a little bit of caution around that. Um, my concern being a catch-all clause could, if it was tested, because it was no, this is no, this is tested, right? So I think from certainly from other people I've spoken to on this is that there's probably going to be legal cases that are going to really further define this in the coming years i would imagine oh, without doubt um and uh, and, and that could be yeah. said probably a lot of this legislation as well yeah. um without but doubt. uh certainly this is this is one uh kylie just generally obviously i've talked in layman terms i'm happy for you to expand a bit further for our listeners as well hey secrecy clauses i mean i've drafted them they're in lots of contracts and they just basically prevent staff from finding out the, the basis for their pay they're deemed oppressive by this legislation and therefore they're now invalid. Yeah, you're not to have them in your contracts anymore. Yeah. And that's contracts as well as policies, Carly? That, that, is that your that's right, as well? yeah, yeah, policies as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So basically anything that you're putting into your contracts now is basically saying that staff have the ability to share information about their terms and conditions of their employment. Mm. I've had some some clients that have asked me about, um, uh, well, hang on a second, my contracts, I've had people that have been here for years, that clause is in there, um, what do I need to do? And, and my answer has been, okay, if it's already in there, um, uh, you know, it's invalid, right? There's no, yeah. uh, there's no need to sign a new contract. They usually have another clause in there that says that anything that's illegal is severable. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So From there's no the need to issue a brand. Yeah. Contract. So I'll, long I'll, as the severance clause is there, yeah. So long as that severance clause is there, yeah. Sure, yeah, okay. That's a good point. That's a good point. And I've certainly said to clients, obviously, that have got uh, policies in there, that's, that's something which they absolutely have to change. It's obviously a lot easier yes. to change a policy. Um, yeah. Uh, you don't necessarily need to change a uh, change a contract. But once again, though, I, my experience is it's um, it's quite a few people by surprise. And some people say, well, how far, how far does this – how far this actually stretched. So you've got two employees having what might consider a water cooler conversation 
Uh, one person says, person A says to person B, uh, how much you earn? Person B can say, none of your business. Uh, I'm not going to tell you. And that's still fine. Um, yeah, that's still fine. <laughs> but person B can equally say, I earn $60,000 a year. Um, and whereas in the past, it could have been clauses in the contract which prevent that second conversation taking place. Um, you know, even if there is, uh, that's, that's, not, that's no longer valid. And uh, so... Paul, does that sound, um, you, you've got a slightly inquisitive look on your face, which always interests me. You've got a question for us, haven't you? I, I'm, I'm just thinking there is so much complexity in here. I'm looking at our list of points to cover, and there's several different dates of implementation mm. here. So mm. it makes it really hard. <laughs> how, do you, how do you know which comes in? Or should you just take the approach that they're all coming in yeah. So let's get it all ready in one go. It is a case that the sooner you can be ready, I think that the better. I think that uh, obviously there's some that are coming straight away. The paid domestic violence leave obviously is uh, is key for businesses, uh, as we said earlier on, and 15 and what's in now. Uh, pay secrecy, the most important thing is that, that there are no clauses or policies in place as of 6th of June this year with that in. If that's issued, that's going to be a real problem. That's the biggest, if there's one takeaway or two takeaways, those are the key ones. I mean, some of the others are really important as well, and there are some different dates. I think it could well be that we might need to do a part two to go through stuff later <laughs> in the year, but that's uh, that's that's absolutely fine. And even though small business doesn't have to implement the domestic violence part now, it can always opt in earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we're seeing one of these other changes is around discrimination mm -hmm. and. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I believe there's three new protected, I'm uh, calling them attributes. Why do we need three? Why do we need more categories? <laughs> there are three new uh, extra definitions. Generally speaking, in my experience, Carl, is a lot of businesses already have a policy, and I found some policies I reviewed already have these three other attributes in their policy already anyway. So I guess when yes. they've been drafted, they may have been future-proof. So the three that have come in are gender identity, Intersex status and breastfeeding are the three attributes that have come in as part of these uh, these changes. And as I say, for some clients, actually, to be absolutely honest, I've yet to review a client's policy as yet that hasn't already got those in anyway. Um, yes. But um, but it's but yeah, there are the ones that need to need to come in. But now it's official. Exactly, exactly right. Yeah, yeah. Now they either legally have to be in there. It's just a case yes. of just. Uh, it's probably a, a tidy enough and updating where there's some some businesses that haven't had it in place. Yes, that's right, yes. This next one's got me a little bit puzzled in terms of how this legislation actually extends and maybe if you guys can explain the extension that we that we talked about off air. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. I think that, um, you know, there's all, there's always been an obligation for employers for a number of years now to have processes in place to prevent sexual harassment taking place within the workplace. Um, this is really, in some cases, of an, an extension of that um you know we've had to stop bullying orders in place in in the past uh there's processes coming in place now to have stop sexual harassment um orders that can be so it actually gives him one thing it does it gives an employee potentially that if it can't be handled or it hasn't been handled to their satisfaction internally it gives um you know it gives employers a, an avenue externally as, as well the second part, which is the stretch of definition, is that it, it equally applies to um, uh, to sexual harassment that may may not be. Well, it's not going to be. It's not, this is talking more than just employee to employee or so or someone internal. This is talking about for someone that might be external. So it could be uh, it could be a it's customer, um, yeah. it could be a supplier, yeah, it could be anybody the employee comes into in the workplace. Um, and so, so there's really an extension extension of that definition. I'm going to pause there because I've said too much. And Kylie, did I say anything that was incriminating there, please? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's perfectly fine. Um, there's also the distinction between sexual harassment and sex-based harassment that's become clear in this legislation. And that's where someone might use a derogatory term in their dealings with somebody of the opposite sex. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, that's good. That's good. And, and look, I think it's fair to say I, I've I've read a few things on this and heard a few things like Kylie. Is that there's a little bit of a, there's a lot of grey here as well. Um, I think that uh, you know in terms of so what what should it, what should um, uh, you know what should employer do what action should employer take um, 
obviously we talked off air and I think myself and Kylie are on the, the same the same view that um, educating people um, on this topic um, and uh, you know and, and I certainly work with employers they might actually go and educate you know in terms of bullying and harassment um, you know and sexual harassment at the same time but educating uh, on the topic is something which is uh, which which is important um making yeah. it real make it relevant to legislation i've already worked with some clients to and, and make sure there is um uh, there is continued education and, and often that might be by by zoom or face to face um i think just getting people just to tick a box and sign off to a policy on this one uh my personal view is that um that's something in the past having the face to face or zoom education has been a nice to have i think that's becoming more of an essential uh, yeah. to, to do that um, yeah, it should be part of your induction. It should be part of a refresher. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how often that refresher really needs to take place. It probably, prob- probably it's annual, I would say. Yeah. No, um, I agree. It's funny that, Kylie. I, I've, I've talked for a few years now about uh, a concept of orientation and a concept of reorientation. Um, yes. And, and that reorientation, um, I often suggest, um, you know, annually is good. I mean, I've got some yeah. clients that prefer to do it biannually, um, but it at least gives them a um, an update and a refresher. Um, yes. And if things go wrong, um, I mean, they sound like very dry sessions, don't they? Um, but I promise yeah. you they can be made more exciting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, and to be honest, I, I've had some clients that have used that as an opportunity to, um, yes, they go through the things which are compliance related, but then they draw other things as well. And whether that to be to do with engagement results, whether that be to do with you know uh, promoting what staff benefits they have, just to make sure it's not just a, a completely dry session. Mm. Um, but uh, but those sort of things are, uh, I think, becoming more important to have in place. So so what would, be, Kylie, what would be the, I guess, legislated requirements in terms of educating employees on the new rules or even existing sexual harassment rules? I don't think there is a legislative requirement in, in relation to education, but when you when you come to the court system, you'll find that judges will require some form of due diligence by the company. Um, so they'll require education. They'll require people to be interactive with that education. Um, they'll require policies to be signed, and yeah, for there to be policies in the first place. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's one of those things that, um, like we said earlier on, the, there'll be cases that will come up in this in the coming years, which will further define this. But um, I think at the moment, um, you know, it's it's a bit of interpretation as to what's come out here, what what might be the right kind of level of uh, you know action an employer should take, uh, and it doesn't have to be difficult. I don't like to scare clients away and say, you know, this is going to be um, you know a long and expensive solution. It doesn't have to be a difficult process to go through that. Mm, no, it doesn't. Something. No. We've got this next one of right to request flexible working arrangements. Now, a lot of people will say, isn't that already there? So what changes do we have and how does it affect us? You're right, Paul. It's already there. Look, my reading of this one is that it just is extending a few definitions. It's giving some more clarity to employers. Mm-hmm. I think that um, in the past, I think that um, – you know, the, the emphasis has been to, um, you know, to just give a, an idea why they're going to decline a request. Um, there is more uh, definition that's gone into that. Um, and uh, and equally what will happen here as well, there's a, there's an external appeals process. So a little bit like we talked about what's in place for, you know, bullying and not going in place for sexual harassment. There'll be an external appeals process um, where employers won't be happy with the, um, the outcome internally. Um, I kind of sigh when I see things like this because I wonder how that's going to clog systems up uh, in terms of how long it takes to get an outcome. But yeah, we uh, it, we are where we are, right? Yeah, essentially, you're right. It is it's already there. Already, can't even think I've missed it. Oh, I think it's emphasising that written correspondence needs to be entered into, mm. and it needs to be something that's refused only on reasonable business grounds. So I think they're I think they're enumerated in the legislation, um, what the grounds are that can be taken into account when they make a decision about flexible working arrangements. Yeah, which I think is more clarity in terms of process and reasons. So I think that could be quite helpful because in some ways I think that, um, you know, it could be quite helpful that an employer um, looks at the reasons um, and at least there's a bit more there's a bit more clarity than perhaps wasn't, wouldn't have been there in the past. 
Yes, a bit more clarity than there is in relation to reasonable additional hours, which is a, probably a topic for another podcast. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Very good one. So unpaid parental leave. Now, is this something additional or? This is actually um, extending current parental leave. So it, it's once again, it's already there in terms of um, uh, people that take parental leave uh, at the moment are, are entitled to ask for, um, for an extension uh, beyond the first period. Um, but once again, this is just given a bit of further definition and, um, and, and clarity. Now, just to be fair, uh, should, we should say, which we didn't say actually, is this one doesn't come in until the 6th of June, um, as is the previous one about the right to request um, flexible work and the process behind that. Now, it's already there, uh, like this is already there, but the process behind it for these two doesn't come in until, um, uh, until, until 6th of June. Um, so, um, but... Kylie, that's my reading of that one. Uh, what, what, a little bit like the previous one, just a bit more clarity. Would you? Would you? A agree little bit more clarity. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm also curious about how this one, how the unpaid parental leave ties mm. in with the use of fixed term contracts. I'm sort of thinking, like in terms of when you know the positions are created by somebody going on, say, maternity or paternity leave. Um, you know, do they interact, or are we talking about completely different things? Um, that's a very good question, Paul. I hadn't thought about them interacting, but you're right. In some ways, they do. <laughs> but uh, I, I suppose if just in terms of, um, you know, the, the fixed-term contract change, um, you know, there there are, there are exceptions, but the, um, the the legislation, this doesn't come in, this is the last one to come in. Um, I put down here the 7th of December. I'm thinking it could be the 6th. But anyway, it comes in in December, you know, a fixed-term contract, the maximum, uh, maximum length is... Uh, is, is will now be 24 months unless there are certain reasonable and once again there's definitions about what is you know circumstances which uh, a fixed term contract can be in place more than 24 months so how i've seen this work in practice at the moment is that so at the moment they've currently got people that have been on fixed term contracts uh for it will be currently say say two years um they can provide in that contract is renewed i'm going to say safety here the 6th of december rather than the 7th um is they can review uh, for a further period before then but after that period any further renewals um unless there's good reason um which come to a number of exceptions as to why you could still do another fixed term contract it would be expected that person uh, would be uh, at that point in time offered a permanent role in order to uh, retain them. I think you're right. It can interact with the other one if you've got someone that's on extended parental leave and then, yes, that can go for two years. So I, I, I hadn't made that connection, Paul. So, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but it's a very, very good one. <laughs> Carly, what have you seen on this one? So obviously this one's a fair way off, but um, that, that's, that's my basic understanding so far. Yeah, I think your understanding is correct, and and I've already started putting these these terms in in contracts because I think it'll just creep up on us basically. Mm. Mm. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I've 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 only got two clients where this would apply to, and I'm already having the conversations because um, it's better that they know now. Um, yes. as opposed to when they're having conversation with me or someone else um, next year and all of a sudden they realize they, they can't do this anymore so so I think um, you know for me it's uh, it, you know it's, it's putting the early um, the early signals in there to make sure people know what's uh, what's coming up later in the year yeah so there's a, a lot of content in there a lot of changes some some not so major and some some a little bit more major but I think a couple of the key things here is that, uh, I'll go back to my earlier comment that ignorance is not an excuse mm-hmm. that you can't plead that you do need to be aware of it and and I think really uh, it's up to a small business owner to get advice here and get help because anytime you're trying to become a HR expert it's taking away from running your own business and look people like Paul and Kylie they've trained in this they've advised in this they see it every day and they're going to do the job far better than you are so and list their services and and look there is a lot of content the, the key dates are a bit of a, a curveball I think and and if we just explain why we're looking at the sixth of the month and I think these are three, six, and twelve months after the date of uh, enactment. Yes, in most cases, it's not quite as straightforward as that because we're looking at two separate pieces of legislation. <laughs> but uh, generally speaking, well, I, wonder, I wonder if it might be useful. Maybe myself and Kylie will work together to put a time frame through in the show notes. Um, would that help? 
I think that would be fantastic, a fantastic resource because there, there is a lot there and there are a lot of different moving parts. As you said, two pieces of legislation, a lot of different dates, different enactment dates for small, medium enterprises under yep. under the definition of a small business here, which is different to the definition of a small business in many other pieces of legislation. I think that's key. And, and look, training, not just training for employers, but training for your employees. Mm. We're going to see a greater emphasis on the need for that. And as Kylie mentioned, being able to demonstrate that you have informed your employees and that they have undertaken training will be even more important. Hopefully it won't affect your business. Hopefully you will not be in this situation, but when it does come before the courts and it's tested, I think if you've demonstrated you've shown that you have trained and put people through an education process, I think you'll be mm. better mm. positioned. Um, yes. Good. I'm glad Kylie agrees. Great. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I agree with what I said before. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> very, very good. So um, lots to take on board there, lots of things to think about. And look, please don't be overwhelmed by all of this. Um, reach out and, and get some assistance. And and look, is there any, um, any particular websites or, or references that would be helpful to go to for small, medium business owners? Um, I, I'd almost say about where not to go to. Whilst the Fair Work website has a, has a lot in there, I think some of it is being updated as things go on. So there is information in there, but I did find one what I call rather one rather unhelpful document. But I think if, ideally, it's a case of um, if people can can reach out and get some support, that's probably a better thing to do. Mm-hmm. So I think a lot of this information is still under development. So keep an eye on it. If there are new developments, we'll update the links in the notes for you to follow. As always, thank you to Paul and Kylie for coming and sharing your your knowledge and expertise and and helping us see a pathway through some of the complexity that we face as business owners and also offering a pathway of how to move forward and make sure that we avoid the risks and make compliance with the new rules easy for your business so that you can get on with running a great business. So thank you, Paul and Kylie, for your input today. Thank you, Kylie. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you for listening to us today. Hope you found that helpful and not alarming. Um, We'd like to provide some help and assistance to you so that you can concentrate on running your business and growing it. If you've got questions that you'd like answered on the podcast or you've got suggestions for a topic that you'd love to hear us speak about, reach out to us at podcast at thebusinessbehindyourbusiness.com. And if you want to check out any of the past episodes or content, feel free to check them out on www.thebusinessbehindyourbusiness.com website. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast in your favorite podcast player. I'm Paul Sweeney. Thank you for listening. 